hell is somewhere down there, and it's hot, and it's full of fire. And pandemonium is kind of somewhere down there too, but maybe not quite as bad. But you can see how our basic ideas of religion and science kind of have combined uh, in a lot of our arts. <coughs> um, when I was a kid, there was a really cool movie called Journey to the Center of the Earth. It starred, uh, at that time, uh, a couple of the big movie stars. Uh, it was, uh, let's see, Arlene Dahl and uh, James Mason. And they went to the center of the earth. I think Pat Boone was in it, oh boy. And notice they found this ancient civilization that looks a lot like kind of a mix between Greek Doric columns and Mayan temple carvings. And um, they were then spit out by a volcano and, and were saved. Well, pretty fanciful. But it's been remade into Journey to the Center of the Earth movies a couple times more since then. And I guess Brandon Fraser from um, George yeah. of the Jungle and the Mummy and all, you know, that guy, uh, he's, he's done the latest one. So it's still kind of a big, uh, big story. Um, even Jules Verne, when he first wrote a journey to the center of the earth. He envisioned a hollow earth, and it was uh, inhabited by critters that looked pretty prehistoric, kind of like plesiosaurs and pterodactyls and things from the dinosaur world. Um, in uh, 1837 to 1842, the United States conducted a survey called the United States Exploring Expedition. And the ships of the Exploring Expedition uh, are credited with seeing some of the first land in Antarctica. They sailed around the world. They were the first to map many of the coastlines of the world, including uh, a large portion of Antarctica. They were the first to map the Columbia Delta, where the Columbia River enters the Pacific by, by, by Seattle in that area. Uh, it was an amazing uh, expedition, and the collections that they made during that expedition uh, eventually became the founding uh, displays for the Smithsonian Institution. So this was a big time deal. One of the questions they were tasked with to discover, and one of the reasons they went down to Antarctica, was they were asked to look for the opening to the center of the hollow world and see if it, in fact, existed or not. This was 1833 to 18, or 1837 to 1843, the, the Van Buren administration. Now, that doesn't sound like that long ago, and we like to think of ourselves as a pretty sophisticated bunch of people making up a pretty great nation, right? And yet, here we were, just uh, a couple of decades before the Civil War, looking for the hole to the hollow center of the earth. Yeah, I mean, and it's, there's still people that believe it. In fact, one of the, the um, uh, tweaks on this is uh, we live on the outer surface of this, this hollow sphere, but then when you come in here, people live on this inner surface also. And actually what we're seeing is a central sun here in this hollow. And we just see the light that comes out of the holes at the end of the globe uh, in our position. So does that make sense? <laughs> well, it was a hypothesis at that time. I think it's pretty well disproved now. But at that time, it was still a hypothesis that in some circles it was taken quite seriously and debated in scientific meetings. So that was kind of the background. But we know that that just can't be because of basic physics, if nothing else. This is the deepest well in the world. It goes down 12 kilometers, which isn't that deep. And it sits over on the uh, uh, Kola Peninsula. It's kind of northwest Russia over uh, kind of toward Finland, up in that area. And uh, basically, they have used all the latest, greatest technology to drill this well. And 
and they have drilled to a point where technologically <coughs> they simply cannot make it work and drill any deeper. It's at the limits of our mechanical abilities to drill a hole. Now, even if we could double those abilities, that's only 24 kilometers, that barely even scratches the surface of Earth. So how are we going to drill a hole to the center of the Earth? <coughs> We're not. It's not physically possible. So how do I know Earth is layered? If I can't drill a hole down there and look at those rocks or at least get a sample back to the surface that I can look at, how do I know Earth is layered? Am I just using smoke and mirrors and taking your money for a science class? Maybe. <laughs> No, we, we do some science. We actually have some things that we do to figure this out. We can't get a direct observation. We have to look at it from some other perspectives. So oftentimes we use other types of science, other events, as a proxy for not being able to look at things directly. But knowing the laws of physics, knowing chemistry, knowing biology, we can use these other observations and say, well, if this occurs, the only way that can happen with our laws of physics is this has to happen. So it gives us the answer in a little more roundabout way, but it is still a very valid answer. This is kind of the silver lining to earthquakes. We think of earthquakes as these big damaging events that are purely destructive. But when an earthquake happens, it sends out a shell of energy throughout the rock in Earth. And we can measure that energy. We can measure how fast it travels through the rock. We can see how long it takes to go distances, certain distances through the rock. And that tells us a lot about what that rock is. The properties of that rock control how that energy wave travels and how fast it can travel basic laws of physics. And we can take those laws of physics to the lab. We can take rocks of known uh, compositions. We can put them under known pressures. We can send an energy wave through them, and we can measure what we get. So by doing that, we can then look what happens in nature and say, ah, we've got a wave that went in this direction, went this fast. That means it's got to be this kind of material, because that's what our work in the lab showed us. <coughs> and that's what we do. So what's an earthquake? Well, if you think of it, it's just a sudden release of energy. Energy's building up. We've got two big, huge blocks of rock like one half of California and the other half of California. And they're trying to move past each other along a big fault zone, a big crack. But they kind of get locked up. You know, the, it's not a smooth plane. There are bumps on it. Those bumps catch. And man, it's just, it's trying to move, but it can't. And the strain is building up. Or I'm sorry, the stress is building up. It wants to move. And then all of a sudden, the stress gets high enough that it exceeds what's holding it together. And boom, it goes. And that sudden release of that stress, of that energy now, is an earthquake. And that energy travels through the rock, and it kind of moves out from the release point as a shell of energy, kind of a big wave. Remember when we were talking about the Doppler effect, how the train whistle, the sound wave, moved out as a shell of sound? Well, we're seeing the same thing here with this shell of energy moving out from the release point. Now, this energy travels in a bunch of different ways. It, it, it affects the rock differently. And there are a whole bunch of different ones, but I'm just going to tell you the two big ones. Okay? The first is what we call a primary wave. And this is because it travels fast, and it's the first wave to arrive at any seismic recording station where we're trying to record that energy coming through the rock. So primary, so we call them P waves because they're primary. If you think about it, if you took a slinky, you know, just a coil spring, and you attached it to the wall, 
And you just sat there and you pushed it back and forth. Every time you pushed on it, you'd compress the, the spring. Every time you pulled on it, you'd stretch it out. And what you'd see is these sections of stretched out spring and compressed spring would kind of move down the spring to the wall, and it would get to the wall and that'd be it. But you could see these sections just kind of move along the spring. That's a P wave. That energy is moving back and forth, and it's moving in the direction of travel. So P wave's going like this, and compression tension is moving along with it. That's why it's such a fast wave, because all that energy is moving in the same direction. <coughs> okay, so what that would do is it would be compressing the rock, it would be stretching it out, compressing it, stretching it out, moving along through the rock. And on the surface, I would see the telephone poles moving apart together, apart together, the wires would be stretching, and one by one they'd snap and, and be destroyed. We'd see cracks opening in the surface, closing, pavement crushing as it closed back up, cracks being left as it opened up. And we can actually see that. Now the other big way that the energy moves through the rock is in what we call a shear wave. And a shear wave moves, well, if I took a rope and tied it to the wall, and I just flicked the rope up and down, and it puts these S's <coughs> into the rope. And as I did that, each S would take its turn moving toward the wall as a new S formed in back of it. So it, it's moving like this. Instead of moving with the direction of travel, it's going across the direction of travel. So it's slower. So it shows up at the seismic recording station second. It's the one that shows up after the P wave. So you can think of an S wave as being a shear wave that shows up second, SSS. Okay? These are going to tell us different things about the rock. One of the big differences between P and S waves is that a P wave will move through any solid material. An S wave will move through solid material, but in liquids or gases, disappears. It doesn't work. A P wave will move through liquid and it will move through gas. It'll get slowed up, but it'll still move through it. That's the difference between this push-pull and this back and forth. Put your hand in a bathtub and just, you know, move it back and forth through the water real fast. What happens? Do you make a big wave at each end? No. You barely even splash the water. And you pull your hand out, and there's no hole there. Right? There, there's no coupling between your hand and the water. That's a shear wave. When you think in terms of shear, there's a big scissors. It's just a couple things moving past each other, but nothing's, nothing's sticking in between. You're cutting, tearing the in-between. Uh, how are tsunamis created? That is basically displacement of water. Um, it's not wind, it's not uh, uh, shear, it is uh, basically bottom falls out or the bottom comes up and um, earthquakes make those rocks move and that gets translated into displacing the water from that area. So the earthquake causes the displacement of the tsunami? Yes. That would be a very typical way of doing it. We're going to be talking about tsunamis later on in the semester, so we'll, we'll kind of get into the okay. details there. Okay. But yeah, good question. Okay, so the difference between shear and P waves is P waves are going to move through any solid, and they're going to move through liquid and gas, but at a slower rate. Shear waves are only going to move through solid. It hits, a, hits liquid, which could be not just water, but think in terms of molten rock. Magma, lava, that's molten, that's liquid, that's going to stop a shear wave. Gas is going to stop a shear wave. So I've got a way now of kind of making some big, admit, admittedly, they are big differentiations, but just by looking at whether a P wave or an S wave gets through a material, when I'm recording the uh, arrivals of these waves from an earthquake, I can tell 
kind of what these materials were, whether they were solid or liquid or gas. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no I could probably talk to you about this after lecture, but I'm curious again. In the previous year, there's been uh, earthquakes in Oklahoma. That's where mm -hmm. I'm from. And it's on the Richter scale. It's been like two point whatever. Yeah. You and can't then, even uh, feel them, basically. Right. But it ceased, and then there were major earthquakes in California. Is it possible that, like, the earthquakes in Oklahoma could have resulted, like, you know, like, waved all the way across the country? Yeah. And, um, the answer to that is no. Those are not related. Um, you can get small earthquakes uh, around big earthquakes, but in this particular instance, those are two different uh, causes there, two different things going on, uh, two very distinct geologic systems. And actually, I'll talk more about that when we talk about earthquakes, okay? <laughs> Good questions. Good questions. Okay, so I've got this, this deal where I can use earthquakes now to kind of tell me about rocks. So, here's the thing with speed, as these waves move through a rock. The more the rock is compressed, and the, more, the denser the rock is, the faster the wave will move through it. So, if you think about it, uh, take a rock, like a piece of iron, that's a rock, and it's dense. And boy, I can put an energy wave in on one side, and it'll go zip right through that piece of iron to the other side. And I can measure that. If I take a piece of, say, limestone that has a lot of holes in it, it's kind of what we call porous, like a sponge. I put an energy wave in one side, and it takes forever to come out the other side. And that's because going from a solid piece of rock into a void space, back to a solid piece of rock, back to a void space, back and forth, it takes up energy, it uses it up, and the wave just starts traveling slower and slower. So I can take basic rocks like sandstone, granite, basalt, I can put those in the lab, I can put an energy wave in it, and I can measure how fast that energy wave would travel through that type of material. So what I see is the denser the material, the faster the energy is going to move through it. The less dense, things like sandstones and limestones, they're going to be pretty slow. And of course, liquids are going to attenuate S waves. And liquids and gases will slow up P waves, but they still get through. But it does slow them up significantly. So I can use the fact that, oh, S wave didn't get through, I know it's a liquid, and P wave got slowed up, I can kind of get an idea what kind of liquid it was. Again, basing it on experiments in the lab. Okay. Other thing is what direction are they going to head off in? Basic law of physics. If I have an incoming beam, whether it's a light beam, an energy beam, whatever, and it hits a surface where the material below is a different density. When that beam goes from one density material to the next density material, a couple things are going to happen. Some of that beam is going to get reflected back. A mirror. The beam comes in at an angle, and it reflects back off at the same angle. So this angle right here would be the same as that angle right there. That's why mirrors work. The other part is some of that energy gets bent, or what we call refracted, and goes down into the denser material. And you'll notice it always bends toward the denser material. So here I've got this material that's coming down. It hits this material here, it gets bent. Here, it always goes toward the slower slower material, so that's going to be the less dense material. I think I said it just the opposite thing. Okay, so as it comes down, it's going to bend as it hits that, that interface and goes into the slower material, it's going to bend toward that slower material. Okay, slower material means less density. So either way, it's going to go that way. So, I can see now, as I go deeper into the Earth, 
even if I just kind of send an energy wave in a 